people don't fully appreciate the scale of the industry that we're in today. And so I think, you know, the recognition back to your question, Alan, about how long will it take? You got to come back to the size of the existing energy system today. It is big. It will take time to replace. But my point is we got to get started on it. But I would say, you know, we, I can't believe you. Go ahead. You voluntarily went back to Alan's question, which he pestered <laughs> yeah, you with the that entire one more time. interview. I'm a glutton for punishment. What can I say? <laughs> Welcome to Leadership Next. The podcast about the changing rules of business leadership. I'm Alan Murray. And I'm Michal Evram. Darren Woods, thanks so much for joining us. Sorry you couldn't be here in person. Uh, we were hoping to do this in person, but the snow got in the way. It's good to be with you, Alan. I appreciate you accommodating the, the weather. Yeah, the, the, the snow was here, by the way, not there in Texas. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Look, I, I want to start by asking you the big question, the kind of meta question. There are a lot of people out there who believe that that an oil company like ExxonMobil making hundreds of billions of, of dollars off of selling oil and gas and a CEO like yourself who's making tens of millions off of that business can't possibly be serious about addressing climate change. Tell me why they're wrong. Sure. I would start with the premise that we're an oil company. I think, you know, as I've taken this job and focused on what's made us successful over the 140 years that we've been in business, it's come down to our ability uh, to take technology and develop products that meet society's needs. So at our heart, we're a technology company, maybe a little different than some of the technology companies that are out there today, in that we basically focus our technology on transforming molecules, and they happen to be hydrogen and carbon molecules. And so while uh, today a large part of that, uh, that technology goes to making products that are combusted, we also have one of the largest chemical businesses in the world that makes a variety of products that go into, uh, the, into society that basically supports modern living. And so our view is our job is to basically take our capabilities in this space and uh, address the needs of society. And as those needs evolve, so do our business. I mean, one point I always make, Alan, is if you go back to the beginnings of our company, we started basically making kerosene to replace whale oil for lamps. Electricity came along, uh, Ford Motor came along, started building cars. We started making gasoline. Uh, during the war, we started making butyl rubber. And so as the needs of society have evolved, so has our company. And they all come back to our ability to, to manage uh, these molecules, these hydrogen and carbon molecules. And so as we look at the transition in the next wave of things that society needs, which is a lower emissions uh, world uh, to decarbonize the, the, the society that we have today, the question that we've asked ourselves is how can we bring our capabilities and skills to bear on solving that problem. And I'm pleased yeah, that- I, I, Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, I'm, I'm, today, you know, if you go back a little bit in time, the only answer was wind, solar, and EVs, which clearly have a role to play and are necessary, but they're not sufficient. One of the things I've been pleased with, uh, with the Biden administration is the recognition that there's a broader set of solutions needed, a, a set of solutions that involve the molecule side of the equation as well as the electron side of the equation. Since we're in the molecule business, that opens the door for us in carbon capture and storage, uh, biofuels, uh, hydrogen, a number of opportunities in that space, which we now can contribute to uh, as that need grows and as the markets develop. We, we wanna talk about all those things today. We wanna to talk about hydrogen, biofuels, what you're doing in lithium, what you're doing in carbon capture. But I do think part of the reason that people are a little skeptical or a lot skeptical about this conversation is because of, of the history that your company has is before your, your time as CEO, obviously, but the history your company has in climate denial, misinformation. I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to remember Herb Schmertz uh, and the, the information campaigns that, uh, that he ran. How, how, how do you address that history? Well, I think we've been very focused on going forward and what are the opportunities for us to contribute in that space. I think some of the perception out there, we could spend a lot of time debating and arguing. That was 30, 30 years ago. I mean, today the world has uh, moved on. The, the understanding of this challenge has moved on. And I think for where, our, where we are today is how can we contribute to a solution set, not debate the past. 
And that's basically what we're trying to do is leverage our capabilities and solve for what society needs. It's no different than what we've done for the last 140 years. We're leveraging the same core competencies, same core capabilities, and figuring out how we can use those to advance products that society needs. And frankly, I think today our strategy is pretty robust to whatever the future holds, however quickly the world transitions, our company's position to basically contribute. So like a lot of other companies, of course, um, you've committed to net zero uh, within a certain time frame. You have a, a shareholder group that is pushing you to do more, to move faster, um, to cut greenhouse gases. Can you talk a little bit about what you are doing and also why you feel, why you're pushing back against this particular shareholder group? Sure. I, I would just start in terms of our pushback to the shareholder it has nothing to do with the environment or ESG. That's not the basis of our uh, mm -hmm. dispute with that shareholder, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Frankly, what we've looked at is, again, with this view, we recognize the challenges associated with, with climate change. We recognize the need to decarbonize and reduce emissions, and we're very focused on doing it. If you look at the progress that we've made and what we share in our and our proxy every year is the progress that we're making with re respect to reducing our own emissions, our scope one and scope two emissions. We've committed to decarbonize, to get to net zero in our Permian operation where we're rapidly growing production to demonstrate that in a world of uh, pr growing production that you can reduce your own emissions. And we've got a net zero commitment, a plan to 20, by 2030 get to net zero. As you know, we've announced uh, an acquisition of uh, Pioneer and we've committed to bring their net zero pledge in 2050 forward to a net zero plan by 2035. We have significantly reduced our methane emissions. Uh, we're basically working around the world to reduce our own emissions. And then we're providing products to help uh, third parties reduce their emissions. So we're starting a carbon capture and uh, storage business. We have three commercial contracts with hard to decarbonize sectors, a steel company and industrial gas company and an ammonia production company. Uh, we'll capture 5 million tons per annum of their CO2. That is the equivalent of all the EVs sold in the U.S. to date. The impact of that reduction on just three deals that we've done. We've acquired Denbury, which is the largest uh, CO2 pipeline in the U.S. to act as the spine to allow us to capture more CO2. And so uh, making significant progress there. We're building a biofuels plant up in Canada. Uh, we've got plans and are developing the world's largest low-carbon hydrogen plant. That plant alone would basically meet 10% of the Biden administration's low-carbon hydrogen ambition. Uh, and we've got plans on, and we're working through on that that will produce low-carbon hydrogen and ammonia to help third parties back out their emissions. And as you pointed out, we've got a lithium business. Again, tapping into our capabilities to understand the subsurface drill, uh, extract uh, liquids, in this case water, extract the lithium from the water and re-inject that uh, water. It's a lower cost production for lithium than that exists out there today. And it's a much, much lower uh, environmental footprint uh, than the current methods. And so we can have a domestic US supplied lithium source to go into this electrification effort uh, that is more environmentally friendly and more cost effective. And so a number of things that we're pursuing and as the markets develop, we are in a position to continue to lean into that and to bring our capabilities and skills to bear. Now, well, that, with a, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to ask you about that as the markets develop. Sorry to interrupt, but 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 that's an interesting point. I mean, the question is, you know, how much of this investment in alternatives is enough? Some people will argue that the European oil companies invest a larger share of their total investment dollars in in renewables than. ExxonMobil does. I mean, how, how do you decide what the right amount of effort is to drive this transition? Yeah, I think that's a hollow argument. I think the first thing I would point to when you look at uh, levels of investment is you, you're comparing investments in wind and solar, which are technologies going into an established market with an established demand and an established pricing structure uh, that's regulated and people get returns. And so our view is we don't bring any real capabilities to that space. Those are, that's the electron solution that I mentioned. We don't bring capabilities other than a checkbook. And so we don't see the ability to generate above average returns for our investors. And so we, while we recognize the need for that, we don't think it's an appropriate use of ExxonMobil's uh, capabilities. 
We're focused on areas where there aren't solutions, where we're going to decarbonize, help decarbonize, hard to decarbonize industries, where today they don't have readily available solutions that wind and solar won't be effective at meeting their needs. So we're, we're basically concentrating our effort in that space. We're starting businesses from scratch. So I think when you look at the investment level, you have to look at it in the context of what is the opportunity set that you're investing in. We're building businesses from brand new. It's gonna take time to get those businesses up and going, but somebody needs to do that. And so I think that the comparison of what we're investing in uh, businesses that don't exist today versus people who are investing in businesses in sectors that do exist is a false comparison. Likewise, it's false comparison to say, we're gonna look at the oil and gas industry, which is an enormous industry with enormous demand and look at what you're spending in that space versus what you're spending in an area where there's basically nothing exists today. Again, a false comparison with time if the market develops and grows and, and replaces traditional energy system, <clears throat> my expectation is our investment will be just as big there. But we're at a much earlier part of the development curve in that space. And that is reflective of the investments we're making. I just gave you one fact, Alan, if you look at what we are spending in reducing emissions, it's the equivalent on an annual basis of one third of what the US EPA spends to manage the uh, environment for the whole of the US. I mean, that's a substantial amount of money for a company going into a sector and a, a value chain of business that doesn't exist today. And Darren, just to I'd go back real quick to the shareholder question, I know you wanted to address that. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit of, you said the pushback is not because of the efforts and the plans to, to cut greenhouse gases, but explain yeah. what's going on. Sure. There. So let me give you just a little bit of context for that. You know, over the last 10 years, we've had 140 uh, shareholder proposals submitted. About half of those are from activist investors or activist shareholders. And I would make the distinction between the activists versus investors in our company. And the difference, the key difference is the activists don't have an economic interest in the outcomes uh, that they're proposing or in the um, uh, returns that the company generates. Uh, of that uh, half of those uh, proposals that have been submitted, Roughly half of those have been submitted by just three activist groups. And so uh, these individuals, while we talk about, we are, we are, I would tell you as a company, very, very focused on shareholder rights. In fact, we like small shareholders. We've prided ourselves on the fact that our company has a very large base of small shareholders. And we work really hard to keep them engaged and to bring them to the table and to exercise their rights and to, and to voice their concerns and their, and their views. Uh, we have a, a extensive outreach program. We try to bring them into the annual meeting. So the, I would say that we recognize the importance of the shareholders voice and want to cater to the shareholders who are real investors, who have a, a, an interest in seeing this company successful and generating return on their investments. We feel, feel a huge responsibility to that. We don't feel a responsibility for uh, activists that hijack that process, a legitimate process, and frankly abuse it to, to uh, advance an ideology that's inconsistent with the well-being of the company. And I would tell you in this case, for Arjuna uh, Capital and Follow This, first of all, both of those proponents have publicly expressed the desire to basically diminish ExxonMobil's business and to stop the production of oil and gas. That's contrary to the, the benefit of most of our shareholders. Um, they have um, submitted this proposal in the past. This is the third time it was submitted. Last year when it was submitted, it got just over 10% of the vote. Under SEC rules, that, that proposal should be, that proposal should be um, excluded if it doesn't ha didn't have 15% of the vote. But the SEC's interpretation of that has led to uh, basically allowing these proposals to come in time and time again. So the shareholders have reviewed that and have spoken on that topic. And their scope three target, their, their proposal asks us to reduce scope three, which is essentially the emissions of our customers. And the way that we would have to do that is to reduce the sales of oil and gas. Uh, so that's getting right into the heart of what we're doing. And our, the uh, follow this has been very clear that their objective is to get us to stop selling oil and gas. Uh, that's basically what we do as a business. And so you've got a proponent getting right into the heart of the business. SEC rules should exclude that as well uh, as ordinary business. And it's, it's micromanaging. And so we're taking issue with the fact that the SEC 
its interpretation of the current regulation is allowing this abuse, and we're looking for relief from that abuse, which we think is actually in the best interest of all of our shareholders. And, and the, by the way, the best interest of society. I mean, stopping the absolutely. sale of oil and gas is not, not going to be good for the world at this point in history. You're absolutely right. If you think about what we sell, we sell LNG. Every ton of LNG we sell basically backs out of coal, uh, coal burning somewhere in the world. Typically, we're sending our LNG out to, to uh, uh, Asia. And so, you know, today there is an advantage to the products that we sell. And, and by the way, the money that we're using there and the capabilities that we've built doing that, we're now using for the transition. And so I think it's, you know, you, you don't want to force, your, we're, they're working a supply issue when the problem is in the demand side of the equation. And we're trying to balance the two, be the most responsible operator so that as long as the world needs these products, that you've got a company that you can rely on to do it environment, as environmentally friendly as possible as we continue to work for opportunities to diversify I, I, and decarbonize. Mahal, Mahal, I just want to quickly follow up on that, though. So you're saying that Follow This and Arjuna are very different than, say, Engine One. I mean, Engine One was referred to as an activist when they came after your board. Yeah, I think, again, this that's completely, that's, that's another, I'd say, kettle of fish, so to speak. Uh, engine number one basically was out to make a name for itself. Uh, it did not have a specific agenda uh, for ExxonMobil and a change at ExxonMobil, other than to bring new directors onto the board. I would point out, Alan, if you look at engine number one, while they were success successful at bringing uh, three directors onto the board, and those three directors came in without an, an, an engine one agenda, but more of an agenda to make sure that the company could be as successful as possible. As we spent the year that they came in, getting them briefed up on our strategy, uh, the basis of our strategy, why we were making the decisions that we were making. When it came time to approve our plan that year in November, all three of those activist investors endorsed our plan 100%. And as we reviewed the strategy and rolled our strategy out, that was endorsed. And so I would tell you, maybe contrary to the, the perception out there, bringing those investors, those board members on that were keenly focused on making sure ExxonMobil was doing all it could to be successful and having them conclude that, yeah, we were and that the plans that we had in place and the strategy that we had developed was exactly doing that, basically strengthened our board and their resolve for us to continue down the path that we were on. And so it's been a, a benefit to the company, maybe contrary to, to reinforce the path that we are on, contrary to maybe what many people thought out there. And we should note, um, I think some of these same groups are also, um, you know, pushing for similar things uh, at other companies. This is not ExxonMobil specific. Um, it's also at Shell and, and, and yeah. others. Let, let me ask you a question that, that draws on your technical expertise and your analysis, uh, because you're now heavily invested in all sides of this transition. You see what's happening in hydrogen. You've made this big investment in carbon capture and storage. Uh, you're now an investor in lithium, so you're part of the uh, uh, electrical economy. How long is this going to take? What is 2050 anywhere near a realistic goal? And if it's not 2050, when is it going to happen? What does your analysis show? So I, I'll start with the end and, and work my way forward with your question. Uh, frankly, I don't know when the end is going to come. I think 2050, from what you see today, what's being done today, the infrastructure investments that are being made, we're not on the path to 2050. I think most objective analysis would tell you that. Uh, we've waited too long to open the aperture on the solution sets in terms of what we need as a society to start reducing emissions, and we're not investing nearly enough in the technology. Today's technology will not solve this problem. Uh, and the reason is uh, there's a cost issue here. And if you look at the, the solutions being offered, the, the, you know, the dirty secret that nobody talks about is how much of, is all this going to cost and who's willing to pay for it. And if you look at the policies that are being put out, the way the governments are advancing this, the cost is very implicit. It's not an explicit cost. Now, we have, we have tabled proposals with the U.S. governments and governments around the world that there are mechanisms to get out there and start down this path using existing technology, but you need to make the cost transparent. And the people who are generating the emissions need to be aware of and pay the price for that, for generating those emissions. That's ultimately how you solve the problem. The issue today is it's too expensive. People can't afford it. And they know, governments around the world rightly know that their constituents will have real concerns with that. And so we've got to find a way to get the cost down, to, to grow the utility of the solution set, 
uh, make it more available and more affordable so that you can begin this transition. And so today I would tell you, uh, we're not on that path. Uh, the policies that are being put in place aren't aggressive enough and don't incentivize the right kind of actions but, to, to be successful yeah. here. But if not 2050, when? I mean, what do you? What path are we on? Where? where? Tell, tell me, Alan. When? When is? When are people going to be willing to pay for uh, carbon reduction? Because today, we have opportunities to make fuels with lower carbon in it, but people aren't willing to spend the money to do that. There are businesses aren't willing to spend it. But are you we could today make sustainable aviation fuel for the airline business, but the airline companies can't afford to pay for what it will cost to make sustainable aviation fuel. And so the challenge right, but today when, is- when will they? when will it be economic? Are you saying never? Th this is the issue. This is, I think this is the value of the IRA, which is you gotta start down, you gotta start with something, you have to catalyze the work, catalyze the investment, get started on the technology curve to see if you can uh, innovate, evolve the technology and get the cost down. And I can't predict if we'll be successful in that space or not. What I can say is we haven't, society as a whole hasn't been doing enough of it. And frankly, uh, society, and I'd say the, the activists, the, 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 the dominant voice in this discussion have tried to exclude the industry that has the most capacity and the highest potential for helping with that some of those technologies. And so uh, how quickly will the technology uh, discoveries come, the innovation comes? How quickly can we scale those things? How low can we get the cost? I frankly can't answer that, but I do know there's a lot of work that needs to be uh, happening today to make that uh, give us a chance of success. There. I'll give but you one example. We're investing yeah. in direct air capture. We're, we're using the technology that we have this molecule expertise that I talked to you about to figure out if there's new ways, new technologies that we can use to directly capture carbon from the air. We've just built a pilot plan, a prototype that we're, we're working on trying to cut the, the cost in half, which by the way, will still be too expensive, but we want to get down on that curve. And there are a lot of companies out there trying to, to advance the technology in this space. How quickly will they, you know, will they uh, succeed? I, I don't know the answer to that. But Mahal, just before we leave this, but you mentioned the IRA. You know, I don't think that's gotten nearly the the attention that it probably deserves in this debate. You're getting huge subsidies to do that, aren't you? They, the 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 way that the government is incentivizing and trying to catalyze investments in this space is through subsidies. And the challenge, you make the point, they're huge subsidies because the cost of doing this today is high. And if you're going to if you're going to uh, drive significant investments at a scale that even gets close to moving the needle, it's going to cost a lot of money. And so I think the government today is trying to incentivize that to get things moving. But I would tell you, building a business on government subsidy is not a long-term sustainable strategy. We are not, we, we don't support that. Uh, we're, we have uh, committed ourselves to um, use the IRA to try to get started on that. But at the same time, we're advocating to move to market, market forces, uh, either through regulation, prices on carbon, different, there are different mechanisms out there today. The challenge with all those solutions that is the cost of that ultimately bears, its, explicitly bears itself in the price of products out there. And that's where the challenge comes. And so today you can you'd do it rather through, just You'd rather just have a straight tax on carbon? I think if you price carbon, put, put a carbon price out there or regulate the carbon intensity of products, uh, that that will drive the markets to start innovating and find solutions rather than having the government craft unique policy to incentivize different levels of investment in different technology spaces. I think, you know, that's, I've accepted that as a, a bridge to getting to an ultimate solution, but ultimately the markets have to work in this space. If we don't get the markets to work in this space, we will not be successful as a society to, to decarbonize. So uh, let's talk about an area where we have seen consumer behavior shift somewhat. Um, the EV space, and I know you guys are, we mentioned earlier, you mentioned a few times you're in the lithium business now. Um, there's been a, a, a slowdown in demand, though. So what do you see going forward in the EV space and how does it impact you? Well, I, I would tell you, so first of all, from our perspective, we don't, we, we, I don't have a view, I don't have a bias one way or the other. The, again, it comes back to what does the market want? And we've always felt like from the very beginning when we were doing the analysis that, that people were extrapolating from very small sample sizes or very small, you know, data sets to this EV growth. So we never believed that, you know, just like any other product, you're, you're moving through segment, consumer segments and tiers. 
that as you penetrate, those segments change and their motivations and abilities and desires, all that begins to, you know, so there, I always felt like we were extrapolating to too small of a set. So I felt like in the past, the projections were too high. And, uh, and I think we're projecting now, we've, we've had this, this lull and people now are kind of doom and glooming. And I don't believe that either, frankly. I think, you know, my mind, we're planning for long term that the electric vehicles will have a role to play. Uh, they'll penetrate uh, to a certain level in society and the costs have to continue to come down. Our view is, you know, frankly, the reason we're in lithium is because we can provide our skill sets to a product that the, that the world's gonna need as we electrify, generally speaking, and battery usage goes up. And so we see long-term demand for lithium. And then our view is we can produce that uh, at a lower cost and more and a more environmentally friendly footprint. And therefore there's an advantage that we can bring to that space. That's why we're interested in lithium. Trying to predict exactly what the sales are, I would tell you, I don't think we're any better than anybody else out there. I would just say, we don't get too caught up in the hyperbole. We didn't get overly excited when people were saying it was going to go through the moon and we're now not, you know, overly depressed that people are saying that the thing stalled and we're not going to take, I think that the answer is somewhere in between there and society will figure that out. And our view is we'll be there with a product that, that's going to be needed to make that successful. And and you're able to to extract it also from the United States that's currently. Right. And there's, there's even more that we're finding. So um, can you also kind of talk about what that means in terms of you know, obviously we're seeing across the board with manufacturing uh, a lot of incentives also to manufacture domestically. Um, right. What does it mean for the company and, and for the country? So I think, you know, our, our, I, there's clearly this view that, you know, as you think about moving into new technologies, new products that you uh, uh, want to have a secure source of supply. Uh, our view is, and I think that's true with lithium, certainly true with energy and, and oil and gas in our business. And, and our view is, you know, I, I think the right answer for any one country or any one segment of, of society or, or business is to have diversified supplies. I'm, I would tell you from our perspective, it's not about making sure that it only happens within the U.S. It's really making sure that you have options and availability. And you don't find yourself tied to any one single source of supply or dominated by a single source of supply. That basically, just like in business, you know, gives that supplier power and, and you want to try to, uh, you know, not be found found to be basically dependent on any any one single entity out there. So I think domestic supply is important from that standpoint. We're not limiting ourselves to domestic supply. We're really, this is a, this is a, um, a, an extraction process that I think, again, has a lot of benefits to what uh, technology currently exists out there, one that we have a capability in, but it will be dictated in terms of where you do it based on where those resources reside. You gotta have a concentration of lithium in this brine water and make it economically feasible. The, the acres that we have in Arkansas that we're trying to develop has that concentration, makes it economically uh, viable, and therefore we're developing that. There are other opportunities uh, around the U.S. and around the world that we'll look to basically develop as well and pace that with the growth in, in the lithium uh, demand and uh, the supply that comes on. Uh, Darren, I, I'd like to go back to this question of how long is this all going to take? Because I don't believe we've quite. Alan needs so, a year. He needs a month and a day. I can't give it, Alan. Yet. I can't give that to you. I don't know the answer to that. All right, but let, but but let me ask you this. Uh, I am a hundred percent in agreement with you that we would all be better off if we had effective governments that could put a price on carbon and and create a market that you could compete in uh, that provides the right incentives to get us there. We don't have effective government. We're not, and we're not, we don't seem to be headed in that direction. Uh, the IRA, as you pointed out, it may not have been the way you would do it, but it was a big, big deal. I don't know how many more things like that you're going to get. So I guess the the question I have for you is, in that environment, what is the responsibility of Exxon Mobil to push the market forward, to push us towards a solution? Uh, and how far are you willing to go in doing that? So I think, you know, this is the challenge. We have uh, a, a whole set of responsibility. One of is it to advance technology, provide solutions that help society achieve its objective. That's clearly an objective. We also have an objective and responsibility to our shareholders. We have to balance those objective sets. I think unlike a lot of activist groups and, and ideologues that are out there who can s focus on a single variable or a single cause, that's a luxury that we don't have. 
So we have to figure out how we can strike the right balance, offer solutions that meet these growing needs, develop technologies, and we do do that. We have invested in these technologies. I, I mentioned to you the direct air capture that we're doing. I, I mentioned the things that we're doing in carbon capture and storage. Those are all things that are very early in the stages that frankly today won't be vi viable long-term uh, businesses if society doesn't, doesn't start to put a value on decarbonization. And so to a certain extent, it's a little bit like exploration uh, in our upstream business is that we see an opportunity. We're managing and mitigating the downside uh, and positioning ourselves for the upside. I think that's the most that you can ask for a public company out there. But to and, your broader- and how, much of, how much of an effect did the, the IRA subsidies have on, on your business? Oh, I, I would tell you, uh, if you, if you look at the lithium business, there's an established market and a price out there. So it's not directly part of the IRA subsidies, but it is driven by EVs, which are part of the IRA subsidies. And so indirectly, the subsidies are behind the lithium business. The carbon capture and storage business, I would say the incentives to do that are all driven through the government. The, the low carbon hydrogen, again, uh, there's not a market out there to sell low carbon hydrogen to a third party without the government subsidies. Uh, biofuels that we're investing in, in in Canada, as an example, are driven through regulation. And so I would tell you today, there is not a viable market where uh, consumers step in and are willing to pay a premium for low carbon products. That's the reality of what we face today. I so you're... I can't drive demand and I can't I can't make customers pay more for a product that has uh, less carbon. But intensity. so you're can, you're a fan of the IRA. Our view is it's it's an important bridge to get things started. And so my mind is, yes, you got to have the government has to play a role. I would have used I would have had the government play a different role. But to the extent yep. that's what they chose to they make the political decisions. They're answerable to answerable to the people. I don't I, I don't pretend to be uh, I am answerable to my shareholders and investors, not to the general public. So the government has its role, makes its decisions. And that construct, we're trying to be a, a positive force to demonstrate that this can actually work and to start down that learning curve. Whether we'll be successful as a society with that remains to be seen. But to your, your, your broader question of when, we don't know the answer to that. What we've been looking at are the signposts. What has to happen in, in order for us to get onto this path. And so we have a very active uh, a process of monitoring, um, you know, investment in infrastructure. You know, if you're gonna electrify the whole country, you, you gotta have transmission systems and distribution systems. Do we see the permits going into those things? Uh, do we see the advances in scale technology? There's a lot of things that we're watching. Do you see a market developing? Many, many things that we're looking at. And frankly, if you look at those signposts, you don't see the activity. And I would tell you, my view is we got to move away from our governments and politicians talk, talking in aspirational terms and uh, building um, the narrative based on hope and roll your sleeves up and start doing some real math here about what's it, how are we going to get from where we're at to where we want to go to, what's it going to take, how much is it going to cost, Who's best positioned to do that and actually start building a, a feasible plan that balances all the competing forces out there rather than ignoring the constraints and challenges and focusing on the hope and aspirations. That, in my mind, will never solve the problem. And we're not doing enough of that as a world, as, as a society. I don't see many governments anywhere sitting down and actually tackling these issues and inviting the right people in industry and government to roll their sleeves up and start building a plan to, to accomplish what what they uh, what the world basically needs. That's a great signpost. Look for you. Tell me when that starts to happen. I tell you, we're on the path. So he's saying September fifth, I think. <laughs> Twenty fifty. Uh, we um. we have been advocating. I, I tell you that we have volunteered with every government uh, that we engage with that it, when they're ready to do that. We're ready to sit down and, and contribute our piece. I'm not. I don't pretend that we have all the answers. I just think that we can we can contribute, uh, as can many other yeah. companies. And when they're ready for a contribution, a serious contribution, a serious conversation, they want to do real math. They want to bring the engineers to the table, use data and analysis to figure out how we solve it. We're here. We're there. We're ready. 
uh, and we've been volunteering to do that for some time now. And I would some, tell you, some countries, some countries must be doing that. Some countries are doing that uh, as you go around the world. I would tell you the U.S. with the IRA, they've been. I would tell you very constructive discussions with the U.S. administration around how do you bring the IRA, how do you translate the legislation into practical regulations that incentivize industry to do these things. And we're, we're bringing our perspective. Again, I'm not suggesting that our perspective is necessarily the only perspective or the right perspective, but it is one that is based on a very deep understanding of our industry and the technical capabilities required to achieve some of these objectives. And so we're trying to be a positive, constructive force here. Positivity and, and, and constructive conversations uh, with government between private sector and government sound like a, a pretty good thing. Um, so we'll take we'll mm -hmm. take it. Um, I want to ask you a question just about you and and your leadership. Um, you've been with the company for a long time. You are driving this transition and transformation currently, but I've seen it go through multiple changes uh, over the decades. And and just give us a little bit of your take of you know what is the Exxon Mobil culture? How has it shifted, and how has it not shifted? What what are kind of the the core? Um, you know, values or aspects of the culture that you feel like are really consistent. Yeah, well, I, I, I think a lot of people don't know this. By yeah, the way. I, I, think I, I don't know anything about. No, that I think you're right. I think, and frankly, I, I, as I came into this job, one of the things that I guess upset me the most was that the perception of our company doesn't match the reality of the people who are in it and the hard work they do uh, every day, and so. One of my objectives is to basically try to help the outside world better understand our company and the people that work here and the work we do. And I would just point to, you know, probably the most explicit step that we took was the, I don't know if you, um, the CNBC uh, engagement that we had with David Faber, where we, I invited him to come in and all I asked him to do was be objective. Uh, and we gave him access to anywhere he wanted to go, talk to any people in our company. And my view was if people on the outside got to see who we were, what we did, and wh how our people approached their jobs, that that would start to um, change some of the perception, recognizing it's a very long road to go on. And so that was the first effort. But if you ask, we have a set of core values, one that I've grown up with, they haven't changed. Uh, we're trying to express them more effectively externally, but I would start with one that's I think for me has been critical for my entire career. In fact, it's what's brought me to this company is integrity, not just being honest and ethical, but uh, being intellectually honest and saying the hard things and taking positions on what we believe on based on the facts and not jumping on bandwagons or subscribing to popular narratives. If we don't believe those are the right things. I would tell you a second really critical um, value for us is courage of conviction, is that once you've figured out the right thing, once you've done the assessment and you've got an answer, you've got to stand up and talk about it. You can't be afraid to go against the conventional wisdom. And I would tell you in this job, certainly, I've felt the, the, uh, the pressure to conform and I know what it feels like to stand against the, the popular narrative. But our view is if you've done the analysis right, if you, if you have done it objectively, if you're not letting your emotions bias your thinking, but instead are kind of coming back to what is it gonna to take to be successful for the long term, that ultimately things come back around uh, and, and you're proven that the path was the correct one. And then the third uh, one that I would just mention is you know resilience, that you, you've gotta be in this for the long haul and you've gotta stand the pressure. And I would tell you, uh, you know, those three of our five uh, core values that we talk about with all of our employees. And, and so when you come here, we're, we're, not, we're not promising an easy uh, career, but we're, we're promising a rewarding one and one that you can feel yeah. good about. The first job I had in this company, a long time ago, uh, my first supervisor had gave me two pieces of advice that I've lived with since that time. And the first one was, if you're ever doing something that you'd be embarrassed for your mother to read about on the front page of the paper, stop doing it. And I've lived with that my entire, and that is really good advice. And the second point he told me was, every morning you got to get up and look yourself in the mirror and make sure you like what you see. And I just yeah. would tell you, you know, do, do the right thing for the right reasons in the right way, and uh, the rest will come with it. And so, I mean, that is, I would tell you, you go across, we have very committed people focused on uh, doing the right thing in the right way for the right reasons. And, um, and they're making a difference. And we have made a difference. If you look at our industry, 
I think it's hard to point to any industry that has uh, progressed human living standards around the world. And uh, we take great pride in that, but we're not, we're not um, buried by that or married to that idea. The idea is that the world changes, things evolve. We've got a capability. Our job is to continue to contribute to society and basically help people uh, achieve prosperity to improve uh, living standards. And our people take great pride in our ability to do that. And we are, you know, going through a transition, but it will be a long one. This people don't fully appreciate the scale of the industry that we're in today. And so I think, you know, the recognition back to your question, Alan, about how long will it take? You got to come back to the size of the existing energy system today. It is big. It will take time to replace. But my point is we got to get started on it. But I would say, you know, we, I can't believe you. Go ahead. You voluntarily went back to Alan's question, <laughs> which he pestered you yeah, with throughout the entire interview. I'm a glutton for punishment. What can I say? But the, the the other thing, Darren, and I that that uh, uh, that uh, notion that you don't want to read anything and you don't want your mother to read anything in the paper. It sort of depends on what paper she's reading, too. <laughs> <laughs> My mother's not a good litmus test for that, by the way, because she thinks her son does no wrong. So, <laughs> oh, good. But uh, I, well, just, good. I would just finish up the, those three I gave you, the two more kind of our core values. Uh, one is care, care about what you're doing and why you're doing it, and um, uh, care for the people that you work with, the communities that you're in, and the environment. Uh, we feel very strongly about that, and I think if you had the chance to be in one of our operations, you would clearly see that. And the, the fifth one that we hold ourselves is excellence, that we hold ourselves to a high standard. We expect a lot of ourselves and of our people, and when we don't uh, meet this, those high expectations, uh, we challenge ourselves to get better. And those are the five core values that I think uh, most everybody in our company uh, believe in and, and resonates with them. But I, but I want to say we appreciate the fact that you have taken a different approach towards conversing with, I wouldn't say the public, with the media on these things. Really appreciate the fact that you've come uh, here today and spent so much time with us on, on this issue. I just have to ask you, I mean, this is a big, complicated, difficult transition. You're under a lot of uh, pressure, a lot of pushback that you've talked about. What do you do to relax? I mean, do you watch Hallmark movies? Do you, I mean, what do you, you? <laughs> you know, I have, uh, the, I have a, a lot of, uh, I put a lot of priority on my family. And so uh, that's probably what I would tell you. I've never brought work home to my family. I try to keep them separated from the things I do day and day. And so when I come home, we, unless I want to, which is very rare, uh, we don't talk about work. Uh, we talk about, you know, what's happening in their lives. I've got three kids. I've got three grandkids, got another one on the way. And so I've invested when I'm not at work, uh, I'm with the family and, and I, I try to get away and, uh, I like to go outside. We spend a lot of time outside. Uh, I've got some, some property in the hill country of Texas I like to get away from. So I think getting, clear my mind and I don't get too weighed down. I try to disconnect from the world. I'm not a social media guy. I'm not on the internet all the time. I, I, I just feel like that, uh, that and, drains and your you. children, your children and grandchildren aren't harassing you about why you aren't going faster to uh, deal with the energy transition. I think my, my grandchildren are too young to that. We'll see when they get a little <laughs> bit older. They're my old, the oldest is four. So I think she's, she's not quite up to that argument yet, but you know, I, given how she is today, I'm pretty sure at some stage she's going to give me, she will give me a run for my money. But I think my kids, they know, they know uh, what I stand for. They've grown up with me. You know, we've always believed in sitting around the kitchen table. And so despite long work hours, my wife and kids always accommodated that. We always sat down for dinner when I was in town. And I would tell you, our dinners were always long and we always talked and I always challenged them. You know, my gift to them is independent thinking and listen carefully, understand what people are saying, but make sure that uh, you make your own decisions and you have a basis for doing that. And I think over the years, I don't can't think of a topic that we didn't we haven't touched on and, and discussed. So my, my mm -hmm. kids know why I do the things that I do. And they know, uh, you know, the, the company that I work for and represent uh, is very aligned with those principles and the values that I have as an individual. And so uh, they know they know what I'm doing to try to help solve this problem for the world. Well, Darren, thank you so much for sitting with us. As Alan said, we really appreciate you taking the time and um, telling us so much about the company, both, you know, the transformation, the culture and, and all of it. Thank you. Happy to do it. Enjoyed the conversation and uh, look forward to maybe seeing you sometime in New York. Mm -hmm.